Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. If you saw the um, poll and it took a minute to take that, we really appreciate that. If you also um, can enter your name and contact information in the chat, that would be fantastic. Uh, today's session, as you heard, we are recording that for educational purposes. And by participating in this session, you are consenting to be recorded. If you don't wish to be recorded, go ahead and disconnect from the session. We'd love it if you would rename your profile. So with your name and where you work or your profession so that if we call on you or if our presenter would like to have an open discussion, she can know where we're all from. We are, Echo is that interactive community. So we would love to have your cameras on and that we all join in these conversations. We are, um, it helps the presenters, it helps us, and it helps us to learn who our colleagues are when our cameras are on. Um, participants, um, if you also have a case narrative that you would love to share or um, get some information about um, from your colleagues, please consider uh, sending in a case narrative. As always during these sessions, to remember to protect individual privacy, so avoid using any identifiable information, uh, first, middle, last names, date of birth, anywhere where they work. If you have any questions, reach out to a hub member. We all have the asterisks in front of our names. A key component of an ECHO session is always building that community of practice. We have a didactic speaker as well as a case presentation and feedback. Um, we'd love for you guys to add in one comment in the chat about a reflection from today's session and one thing that from today's session you might add to your practice. As always, we do have pre-registration. So if you pre-register, you can get um, information ahead of time, as well as um, upcoming sessions. We are doing a credit for attendance. So there will be a survey that is sent out at the end of today. After you fill that out, we will send you a credit of attendance. And I'm gonna let Jared take it away for a minute to talk about um, CMUs. Thanks, Janelle. Yes, we are offering for this session both CME and nursing contact hours. So you do need an account with the University of Utah CME office. After this session, Michelle Redfield will send out an email with information on how to gain an account and how to utilize it. Today's code is 314195. You can find that in the chat and you do need to claim that credit by midnight tonight. That code expires at the end of the day. As far as nurse contact hours, again, watch for Michelle's email. You need to sign up for nurse contact hours by taking the survey. Watch for that link. That survey is due by tomorrow, Thursday at midnight. Thanks, Janelle. Great. Okay, hey, um, at this one, uh, we do always have information on Canvas, our recordings, the PowerPoints, case presentation, and resources will always be shared on Canvas. If you need to have access to Canvas, you can reach out to Kurt Phillips at USU or Project Scope at USU. REDCap is the uh, data collection that will the survey will get sent through. It typically comes one to two days after the session. And always check your junk or spam folder. Sometimes it gets directed there. Uh, again, a case study is just that valuable information to be able to share information about cases that are boggling our brains or um, being able to hear from our colleagues ways that they may be able to help. So if you're interested, please reach out to us and uh, consider submitting a case. We do have a Facebook and Instagram that we share information about. As always, also remember the medical home portal. Jennifer, that Dr. Goldman Luthi, that's a, like a tongue twister. 
she is, they've done an amazing job of putting some information about NAS and NALS on that. So also be able to be sure to check that one out. Um, I'm really excited today to have Jamie Meekham, who is the director of, and a speech language pathologist over here in the communication disorders and deaf education at Utah State. She is an amazing speech and language pathologist and is going to be able to share some great information um, with us today on language and um, trauma and language development. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie to share with us. Okay. Are you seeing the right screen, Janelle? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. Um, as Janelle said, my name is Jamie Meekham and I am an associate clinical professor at Utah State University um, in the speech and language clinic. I'm the director here in the clinic. And so please feel free as we go through, if you have questions to ask, put them in the chat and, and Kurt will ask them. Um, so I appreciate everyone's input. Today we're talking about um, language outcomes and trauma. And um, what, we, what, what I'm hoping for today is that we'll be able to identify common impairments with receptive and expressive language and social communication that are related to trauma and trauma exposure um, that will be able to understand language development um, in prenatally expo exposed, um, abused, and or neglected children. And we'll learn some principles for effective intervention and strategies on how to implement those principles. Um, some of the content today may be difficult to hear. So if you feel triggered by the topic or the presentation, please feel free to take care of yourself. Um, one thing that I have definitely learned is that we cannot care for and treat our clients or our patients if we don't take care of ourselves. So take care of yourself first. Um, first, we're gonna talk a little bit about trauma. Trauma is an overwhelming event that renders a child helpless. Um, today, we're talking about trauma with children, but we need to realize that traumatic experiences happen throughout the lifespan and impact different people differently, and that trauma can also happen to a child prenatally. There are different types of trauma. Um, trauma is the ongoing impact of an event or an experience. It can be maltreatment, such as abuse, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, or neglect. Um, in 2019, there were 656,243 substantiated cases of maltreatment in the United States. So that, you know, begs the question of if that's how many were substantiated, how many were unsubstantiated? Um, state sanctioned violence includes exploitation, impoverishment, police violence, slavery, and human trafficking, which we're seeing much more of. Uh, migration, having to migrate under duress because of ethnic or racial violence, disasters or gang violence. Um, racism, and other forms of systematic in exclusion, including isolation and bullying, and adverse childhood experiences, which are experiences that happen in a child's life that can cause trauma, including abuse, neglect, um, maybe losing a parent, uh, divorce, death of a loved one, maybe a grandparent, exposure to violence, mental illness, drug or alcohol use by a parent or an incarcerated parent. Complex trauma is trauma that happens within the caregiving or family system. Um, you know, in our society, home and family are supposed to be the safest source of stability and strength. And when chronic negative interactions occur, it causes trauma. Complex trauma can also happen prenatally. So when a mother is exposed to chronic stress or participates in activities or behaviors that can endanger themselves or their fetus, it will impact development and it's considered complex trauma. 46% um, of children in the US have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. And 20% of children in the US have experienced at least two. So we're talking about 
more than 50% of the population. So these are children that you will see in your practices, in your schools. Um, they are children that we will treat. Um, trauma causes stress and toxic stress can permanently alter our brain and our language development. Our biological stress response is designed to save our lives um, from something threatening and that's healthy. So stress can be healthy. The promise, problem is, is that when the stress response is activated repeatedly, it becomes overactive and it affects our brain development, our immune system, and even how our DNA is read and transcribed. So high doses of stress hormones um, can inhibit the brain's exec executive functioning, which make it harder for kids or adults to exercise impulse control, um, have memory, and, and use and learn language. Our brain is built from the bottom up. Um, some research was done and in looking at MRIs of children who had been exposed to trauma and those who had not. Um, in in trauma-exposed children, there was a shrinking of the hippocampus, um, which is important for memory and emotional regulation, and increased size of the amygdala, um, which is the brain's fear center. So this can make a child hyper hyper vigilant, um, oversensitive to threats or challenges. And for ch children who are exposed to high doses of adversity, the pleasure and reward centers of the brain can be affected. So the amygdala begins to act as an accelerator. Um, it's turned on all the time and it tells the prefrontal cortex in our brain to break. It's told, there, it's told to stop functioning um, in order to protect. So we're constantly in that that fight or flight mode and the centers of our brain that we use to learn and develop language are shut down. So just in an overview, when a child is exposed to complex trauma or adverse childhood experiences, the centers in the brain that are responsible for language and social development are overridden by the stress re response and they're basically shut down um, in order to protect the child. As we continue to talk about the effects of trauma on language development, I'd like you to keep uh, a family in mind. This family was recently seen in several clinics here at Utah State University and the Sorensen Center for Clinical Excellence. Um, at this point, we've assessed three of the six siblings. They range in age from 14 to five for speech and language delays. Um, mom disclosed years of family trauma, including abuse. The children have not had access to adequate health care. They don't attend public school. Um, they've had no social networks outside of their home. In the past year, all six children have been diagnosed with PTSD. Three have been diagnosed with severe hearing impairments and three have been diagnosed with severe expressive receptive and social language delays. One has been diagnosed with a phonological impairment. Um, the other two are on a, a list um, and will be assessed shortly. All six children stutter when traumatic events are brought up. And the last year is the first time that these children have interacted with adults outside of their home, seen a pediatrician or any kind of health care provider. Um, this includes prenatal care or care following birth. So these families and, and these children are out there and we're going to see them and work with them. And it's important that we understand how trauma affects their development. Um, children who are exposed to trauma prenatally, whether it's drugs or alcohol, maternal abuse or neglect or chronic stress for the mother, um, have low gestational age and low birth weights. They have neurophysiological changes, neurobehavioral development, which is slowed and delayed language development development. So if we go back to that case and think about that case study family, by the time all six of those children were born, they'd been exposed to complex trauma. And as they've grown, they've continued to have this extreme stressor in their lives. Signs of trauma in very young children, um, they scream and cry more than typical. They feel under pressure or timid. They may have nightmares, develop new fears and have anxiety. 
they wet the bed, uh, have poor eating habits, or may be, lose weight, um, may revert to baby talk. They can recreate the traumatic experiences during play, and they have stunted developmental growth. Elementary age children may start to feel shame or guilt. They also have fear and anxiety. They become extremely clinging with adults they can trust, whether it be their teacher or a therapist, um, a neighbor, a family member. They have trouble sleeping, worry excessively, have difficulty concentrating, startle easily. Um, they either repeatedly talk about the experience or they refuse to talk about it at all. And they have declines in school performance, um, loss of friends, and memory difficulties. <clears throat> so there have been three systematic literature reviews in the last few years that have looked at the differences between children with and without trauma histories. Children with trauma histories have been found to have difficulty with a vocabulary, language comprehension and production, and pragmatic skills. So social communication, being able to take someone else's perspective to be able to tell a story about themselves or explain something and to think about how their actions might affect others. Children in preschool and up to three populations will have limited vocabulary, unpredictable behaviors. They may be extremely frustrated and lash out behaviorally. Um, they have an inability to follow directions and difficulty making friends or connecting with others. As children grow, they'll have um, decreased receptive and expressive vocabulary, which will show up as a shortened mean length of utterance, um, low vocabulary for naming objects. They will have difficulty with auditory comprehension and following directions. Um, They'll have deficits in narrative and expository language skills, which is one of the largest impacts in, in language is that they have limited ability to tell a story with cohesion and, and the information that's needed, which makes it difficult for them to express what has happened to them and make it believable. Um, Pragmatic skills are delayed. They lack social skills and social competence, social cognition and executive functioning. Um, these children are not learning about the world around them and they're not able to communicate the things that they know. Children who have trauma are often misdiagnosed. Trauma responses can look like a lot of other disorders, uh, particularly if you don't ask the right questions and get to know the family. Um, when we look back at the case study family, there had been diagnosis of uh, ADD and autism spectrum, um, sensory integration dysfunction, learning disabilities. These were, were all diagnoses that that mom had come up with as she had used Google to try and figure out uh, you know, what was wrong with her children. And as they've seen different healthcare providers and um, received evaluations, all of their symptoms also can be, come back to their trauma. Um, so it's often difficult to diagnose and often misdiagnosed when a child has experienced traumatic events versus other physiological um, symptoms. Attention deficit and autism spectrum disorder, particularly children often get misdiagnosed um, when really their problem is that they, they've had um, been exposed to trauma. So in summary, all told, trauma manifests itself with neurological changes um, in the brain that are associated with cognitive and language development, emotional understanding and regulation. Um, these, these kids are gonna have ongoing deficits throughout their life in their ability to recognize emotions and link emotions to situations they aren't accurate in identifying positive emotions. So they don't know or recognize um, sadness 
or happiness, they are quick to recognize anger and they can, they perceive anger in ambiguous situations that um, they don't understand. They have fewer and less detailed episodic memory. Um, and that's as early as the preschool years. They just, they don't remember. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration um, defines trauma-informed practice as practices that are based on the knowledge and understanding of trauma and its far-reaching implications. Um, trauma-informed practice has four components. We need to realize the widespread impact of trauma, recognize the signs and symptoms, respond, by integrating our knowledge into practice and resist re-traumatization. Trauma-informed practice is safe. There's trust and transparency. There's peer support for these children. It's collaboration and mutuality, empowerment. We need to give them a voice and a choice and understand the cultural, historical, and gender issues that they may have faced prior to when they were brought into our care. So in order to learn this framework and understand how to, how to treat these children, we need to go from asking what's wrong with this child to what happened to this child. Now, by understanding that the child has experienced trauma, we can help them work through it and, and help identify the impairments. Trauma-informed practice is a team process. It's assessments that identify strengths and interventions that focus on strengths. It's learning about the child and the family and exploring the macro level processes that affect the child. Um, you'll complete evaluations and interventions like you would with any child with an added layer of holistic understanding that you can't just treat the child. Trauma happens to the whole family dynamic, to the caregivers, um, to everyone in the child's life. And so it needs to be treated holistically. Trauma-informed practice looks like creating psychological and physical safety for the child, um, being consistent and transparent, having clear boundaries, being aware of possible triggers, and listening to the child's voice and providing them choices. Uh, children often, especially children who come from trauma-ridden backgrounds, don't know how to make choices and their voices are not heard, so they don't feel safe. So if we can set up a safe space where they feel safe, they know that we're gonna be consistent, we have boundaries and that we listen to their voice and give them choices, they're gonna be more likely to open up and we're gonna be more likely to make a difference. Trauma-informed assessment um, can include standardized assessments, criterion referenced assessments, interviews, and observations. Um, in kids who have a trauma history, those interviews and observations become the most important parts of your assessment. You need to get to know your client, get to know their family, get to know the caregivers. You need to observe them in different settings. Um, how are they like in your office versus how are they like at school? Um, you know, how do they behave at home? Are you seeing differences in the way they communicate and the way they behave depending on their environment and the people that are around them. Um, until, you, until you see them in multiple situations and with different people in different settings, it's hard to have a full understanding of what the child's strengths and weaknesses are. As you move into intervention, um, the most important thing things that we can do for children who have trauma histories is to be informed and to have a strategy. We need to provide safety 
and minimize overwhelm. Um, we have to change our mind about the behaviors and what the child's trying to communicate. We need to recognize trauma behaviors, establish boundaries, provide choices, make sure that our intervention is strengths-based. These kids aren't used to being praised. They're not used to having strengths. So if we can really hone in on their strengths and use their strengths to um, teach them and increase their communication, they'll have more success. We need to be able to address and understand their triggers and then support resiliency. Um, we need to teach them skills that support self-sufficiency, teach them that they can overcome, that they can move forward. When we look back at the case study of, of the family, um, the key to assessing and treating this family has been open communication, empathy, and transdisciplinary care. Um, transdisciplinary care is vital in treating children and families who have experienced trauma. You can't treat clients who have been exposed to trauma in a silo. It just doesn't work. You have to work together with other disciplinaries so that you can understand the big picture. Um, as far as this family goes, we've had social workers, audiologists, vocational rehab counselors, speech language pathologists, um, all working together to treat the entire family using a holistic approach. And um, you know, if we don't communicate with each other, we're not helping the family. Um, one just quick example, um, we did an evaluation just last week on a six-year-old, the six-year-old in this family who is a twin. Um, these twins were born at home, um, weighed four pounds and didn't have any prenatal or postnatal care. Um, so developmentally, they've been behind from from the beginning. Uh, and when, when mom brought her in, she was convinced because of some things that she had seen on Google that, that this little girl had autism because of some behaviors that she exhibited, particularly when she got nervous, she would start to rock um, and she would get into the fetal position and not make eye contact. And as we went through all of the assessments, um, it became very clear that her delays were due to trauma. These, these behaviors didn't happen spontaneously or they didn't happen um, just during a regular evaluation. They happened when she was feeling stress. And it was a really difficult conversation to have with mom that you know, there's no markers in our evaluations for autism. The markers all show trauma. And that was really hard for mom to hear. There were a lot of tears um, but I was able to talk right after that session with her mom's vocational counselor who works here and, and help the vocational counselor to understand what mom was trying to process. And then they were able to work through that in her next session. So it's, it's key to work together as a transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team so that everyone has the same goals and is working toward helping the, the whole family. I think, you know, as healthcare workers, as teachers, one of the biggest things that we need to do is learn advocacy. We need to learn how to stand up for families and children who have been abused and neglected, who have experienced stress and trauma. We need to help change the language and the mindset about the behaviors that these kids exhibit. We need to learn the effects of trauma um, in all areas of a person's life and how it impacts their body. Um, recognize when there's a need for a trauma assessment and always remember that children and adults can heal from trauma and we can help them. We can be the catalyst that helps them to change. Um, thanks for this opportunity, Janelle. I hope that, that it was informative. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if, if there are questions. Jamie, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my computer froze halfway oh. through, so I've not been able to hit my mute button or um, answer it. So I just wasn't sure if you could hear me or 
Kurt would have to take it away. So I appreciate that um, great discussion. I loved all those things. I am gonna just let everybody answer, ask any questions if they have it, so. And you guys all look unmuted to me and I can only see four of you. So Kurt, I'm still not back to it. So you might need to facilitate this. Sounds good. I think I see everybody still is muted anyways. So uh, if there's no questions, um, what we're gonna do today, thank you, Jamie. And as I'm sure Janelle's expressed to you, uh, you're welcome to stay on and join our case study. You're welcome to go if you need to go. So thank you for your time today. Thanks. Um, we're going to go ahead and move into the case study. What we decided to do, because last session, um, a couple of weeks ago, we didn't have the opportunity to really spend much time talking about the case. Um, it was presented well, but we just didn't have a lot of time to, to talk about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick review of that case. And then Justin, Benson, Justin, are you still here? I believe Justin yeah, was involved. Sure. Okay. I believe yeah. Justin was involved with the, with this case. And so we're going to, when we get to the questions part, um, we're going to try to answer a few questions. Just, uh, are we going into groups, Janelle? Did we decide we're doing groups? Yes, Bailey's got those set up. Okay. So once I've reviewed this case really quickly, um, I'll copy and paste the uh, questions from this case into the chat, and then we'll move into uh, into our groups and just discuss some of the questions based on this case. So if you remember right, last last week there was a nurse from Vernal, I'm forgetting her name right now, Becky. Becky uh, <clears throat> had a case study for a four-year-old, um, had exposure to alcohol, methamphetamine, heroin, and stress before birth, afterwards had kind of an unstable environment, neglected failure to bond, was removed to the, from the home and had three different foster homes. Um, I'm gonna share my screen so you can see where I'm reading off of here on the slides. No, let's see if I can just get to, uh... okay, we're just gonna do it this way because I'm not gonna take the time to figure out how to make it big. Um, and so uh, the delays here, you can see expressive receptive language, gross and fine motor, cognitive, adaptive and social emotional. So pretty much across the uh, span of different um, delays that he had. At age three, he was diagnosed with these several diagnoses, ASD type two, attention ADHD, um, oppositional defiance, fetal alcohol syndrome, um, and a variety of others, language delay, anxiety and depressive mood, um, trauma, stress-related disorder, uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, he had the history of neglect we talked about, uh, sensory processing disorder, and a reactive attachment disorder um, due to the ASD diagnosis. Um, when we looked at the goals that the family had, was to improve the skills required to be at home and in the classroom. Um, they, I believe they had been doing some behavior analysis as well as occupational speech therapy. Um, and uh, they wanted those goals, the therapy goals, to be focused on self-regulation, emotional regulation, communication, social interactions, cognition, and sensory integration. So um, a lot of those things that uh, kids are required to have to be able to, to uh, be successful in school and other social environments. Um, also wanted to make sure that the parents and caregivers were educated on the effects of trauma and the ways of managing some of those behaviors. Uh, the barriers, um, because it was in rural Utah, a lot of those services aren't available. Um, a lot of those services, even in areas that aren't rural, are difficult to acquire because of long waiting lists. Um, also, the school district um, out there was reported to not want to uh, offer those services or do testing for some of those on some of those diagnoses. Um, also, because of the uh, other family and other commitments, there was a lot of um, stress because of time commitments. Um, the therapies and other services are also, we know, expensive. And uh, when, uh, when kids are in the home with early intervention versus outside of early intervention, the uh, home environment versus an office or uh, other environment is, can sometimes trigger some of these uh, behaviors and some of these difficulties this child had. So here's the questions that I will copy and paste into the uh, chat when we go into those groups. So first of all, how can more resources be made available in rural Utah to these children, especially to foster and, and adoptive families? Um, with regards to diagnosis, many of them go in undiagnosed, which means they can't get the, the help they need and how can this testing be more readily available? I know Justin's had a lot of experience with this in Vernal, um, trying to find uh, services that uh, 
will meet the needs. A lot of kids, I think Justin, you said had to go to Provo or Salt Lake to get some of these services to uh, be able to utilize those. So um, when it comes to early intervention, how can it be made a priority for these kids? Um, how do we educate and help parents re recognize the need they have to advocate for their kids? And then uh, last question, why aren't more resources available um, to these kids and to the adults? So Justin, is there anything else that you want to um, share with regard to this kid? Uh, no, that that sums it up. I did. I actually called her after the meeting and uh, talked to her a little bit about some of the resources that um, were available that she could tap into. Uh, she she she's also both parents are working, um, and she just got a new job that requires her to. She's working more than she used to, and so the, her time frame. Her she's got some time constraints as well, um, but. Uh, uh, Anyway, yeah, that, that sums it up, the slides there, so. Okay, is there, are there any questions kind of in a general nature um, that anyone has for us before we switch and go back to uh, go into the groups? I'll just share the screen again. I just wanna put up those diagnoses um, that were, uh, were, that this child was diagnosed with. So quite a few there, maybe just take a look at that. So as we go into the, uh, groups as we try to answer those questions you'll recognize um, across the uh, across the spectrum of, of affecting cognitive social um, sensory and so many other areas so thoughts or questions and then michelle i don't know if you're back since i still can't see anybody um, but if you want to throw up the poll and everybody, as you're coming back on, if that poll comes up, take a few minutes to do that. And then I'm going to let Kurt take it away. All right. While we're waiting for everybody, I'm trying to figure out <clears throat> on this to try to make it look a little better, but I'm failing miserably. So maybe we'll just go back to Plan A. Um, Michelle, would you mind throwing up the poll for everyone to do for us, please? Thanks. All right. Um, so here's this poll. If you will go ahead and take just a minute and fill it out. I think it's just a couple of questions. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll kind of go through the groups. How many breakouts were there, ba Bailey? There was four. Four breakout groups. So let's just start with the last, start with group number four. And if you want to just share with us the uh, the information that uh, came out of your group with regard to those questions we threw into the chat, um, was there a spokesperson or peoples from group four? It'd take about three or four minutes. Kurt, do you know which group was group four? Um, so group four had Tiffany Werwood, Tiffany Anderson. It was their group. Okay. Looks like Tiffany posted in the chat. Okay. Anybody else in that group want to share a little bit of the thoughts that uh, you guys came up with? Um, we just kind of really talked about um, how there needs to be more psychoeducation kind of conveyed not only to parents, but also to different agencies. And I had posted the, or I had just posed the idea that, you know, we really need to start with educating these providers. There are many times where you're going to have a, a foster family or adoptive parents um, kind of not get the full history of the kiddo and their full experiences and trauma exposures. You're just going to get like a, a sliver, right, of the experiences that that kiddo had. Um, and so how do you, how do you work with that? Um, we talked about, uh, than just providing some sort of like training for parents after even going through the adoption process. Um, because like we had learned from the presentation, these um, exposures to trauma don't just, you know, kind of resolve themselves. They're kind of ongoing uh, learnings that have to occur for the child to really um, almost learn how to retrain their brain, right? That not everything is, is, is an alarming um, response. So yeah, we talked about 
just the different systemic levels where psychoeducation would need to come into play so that we can learn how to deal with that um, better. Perfect. Thanks, Cynthia. Anybody else from that group want to comment on things? I think that's critical that um, the parents, particularly like say foster and adoptive parents that haven't had the lived experience that that kid's been through um, to make sure that they get as much of the pictures they have or as they can so that they can appropriately uh, advocate for the child and uh, make sure that the right services are there. Okay. We want to go to group three. Bailey, who's group three? That is Justin's group. Justin's group. Okay. So we talked about um, uh, Utah Family Voices uh, and how just one of the things that Becky had mentioned in her um, in her study was that the school district was kind of pushing back on her and she was having a hard time getting uh, services through the school district. We talked about how Utah Family Voices can, and the Utah Parent Center can send out a, a representative to sit in on an IEP meeting with you and help advocate for services there. Um, different resources. We, we discussed the different resources that are available in Vernal, um, but we specifically talked, uh, talked about looking into um, like, a, like a peer networking um, program. Um, Lisa Rock brought this up. Uh, and reaching out to the foster foster care of Utah and seeing if there's like a peer peer parent for foster for other foster parents that can help be just a sounding board or someone to to listen. Um, uh, I don't know if Cody Thurgood is in this meeting or not, um, but was we we talked about how she could be a resource for um, for this family as well. Um, and then we, we, Dr. Goldman Luthi discussed the medical home portal and how there are resources for foster parents and foster care uh, through the medical home portal. And then we can find all sorts of resources and providers for different, um, different needs through this website. Um, and then uh, Kim, I can't remember her last name. Kim talked about the South Main Clinic and how um, they're doing the stat right now as a good uh, a screener for autism. That, that's a, anybody else in our group want to mention anything more about that, Lisa or Heather? You did great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Justin. And just a reminder, those who are kind of the spokesperson or who might have taken notes, if you'll get those notes and just email them to the uh, ECHO, the USU, um, the SCOPE, scope uh, email there. Um, maybe Bailey can put that email in the chat for us. If you'll just email those notes to scope, we'll put them on Canvas so that uh, not only all of us can have it, but those who are working directly with that family can have these resources that uh, we're going over now. So um, group two. And that was Mindy Tooler's group. Okay. You know, so we talked about a lot of the things that have already been mentioned here. Um, Utah uh, Parent Center featured prominently in our discussion. Um, we were concerned about the fact that this child has sort of been turned away from school and school services and felt like the Utah Parent Center might be able to um, help uh, work through whatever's going on there and help advocate um, because those things are, um, they are the law. <laughs> Uh, and that would be extremely helpful for this, this child and this family. Um, and also that uh, there, there may be access to services um, because of uh, Medicaid and, and maybe telehealth services um, being offered right now. So it would be important to look into those. And again, the Utah Family Voices and Utah Parent Center would be um, really good um, help there. We also brought up that there is um, uh, the uh, integrated services program. Um, folks from that group are on this call and so they're part of the Bureau of Children with Special Health Care Needs um, Department of Health and they have um, uh, they have the ability to provide care coordination in um, rural areas of the state if that's not um, already in place and they have some agreements in place with some of the local health departments that can help coordinate um, in cases like these. So I uh, would, would highly recommend reaching out to Integrated Services um, and Utah Parent Center and of course the Medical Home Portal we talked about 
um, the fact that there, there is uh, information, for instance, on um, fetal alcohol syndrome there, um, autism, foster care, as Dr. Golden Luthi pointed out, and um, where we're aware of service providers for Utah for the um, situations with those conditions, um, that's indicated in the website. So um, kind of some online resources and then in-person resources as well. Great, Mindy, thanks. And you know, you bring up a point that I think is critical, especially in places like Utah, where there's a lot of rural and frontier areas, um, the ability to do virtual. I mean, we've all learned how to be virtual over the last couple of years. And uh, even though sometimes we can't do it exactly how we'd like to, you know, sometimes, you know, 80% is better than nothing as far as being able to get those services out there. So uh, I think that's great. Thank you. And last but not least, group one, take the last couple of minutes. Um, yeah, so we had discussed too, um, kind of a lot of the similar the similar things that have already been talked about, and also about the difficulties in providing services into some of these very remote rural areas where um, it really comes into helping families and educating families on the knowledge that maybe they need to to receive services, and also on how to. Um, to get services into these remote areas where maybe electricity and cell service is even an option. Um, we talked about um, in, you know, in Wyoming, kind of some of the things that they're doing there. And we've talked about just the travel that was happening with many healthcare providers prior to COVID and that, um, you know, that we may have to also settle for phone calls if we are unable to have the video because of the reception quality. Thanks, Tressa. I think that's critical. And I hope that you guys are kind of monitoring the chat as well. There's a lot of resources being put in the chat um, with regard to, as they're talking about integrated services, um, medical home portal, um, Utah Parent Center. So hopefully if you uh, have opportunity to take a look at those uh, resources that are over there in the chat. So I think that's all that we've got to do for today. Um, Janelle, was there anything else? I know you can't see anybody, but I think we can all hear you. Anything else you wanted to review or Bailey before we uh, shut down here? No, just remember to send in those um, recommendations so we can share those with the family as well as post them on campus. And also that our second session for November is going to be happening next Wednesday, November 17th, instead of having a week off because of the holidays. So in December, November and December, we're having back-to-back -back sessions, but you won't want to miss next week's session um, on community of practices, as well as uh, resources for throughout the community. Thank you all. Bailey, anything else before we go? I think so. All of you, again, thank you for your participation. As the person that does the evaluation on this project, I'd again encourage you to uh, look in your emails for the survey that I'll send out. I'll either send it out this afternoon or tomorrow morning, um, and then it'll come to you every Tuesday at 10 o'clock until, uh, until you do it um, or until we have another session. So just encourage you to do that. That's how we understand better how to uh, format these and the topics that are needed and that sort of thing. So thanks for your time. Hope you all have a wonderful day.